News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, Murder Among the Moneyed. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at two cases of murder involving workers and servants that take place in aristocratic settings. Our first case from 1746 relates the horrific slaying by the footman of Mrs. Dalrymple, wife of Captain Dalrymple. The slaying was so horrific it was revealed that one eye was cut out and her brains protruded in two locations with estimates of over 100 wounds on her body. The reason for this anger? The footman felt he had been insulted. King George II was said to have taken a personal interest in this case. Our second story from 1885 takes place at the fantastically spectacular Blenheim Palace grounds, home of the Duke of Marlborough and the very location where Churchill grew up. Two cantankerous workers on the estate have a long-standing feud which one day spills over into a bloody death. An interesting story of what can happen when one is consistently forced to work with someone one hates. The Duke of Marlborough was said not to be best pleased of the headlines screaming murder on his grounds. Two murderous stories of revenge from 1746 and 1885 is today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We do hope you enjoy the show. Case 1. We start this episode with a case from 1746. Our unlikely culprit, Matthew Henderson, in service to Captain Hugh Dalrymple, who will later become Sir Hugh Dalrymple, steps on the toe of Mrs. Dalrymple. Henderson is upbraided for his clumsiness. The scolding eats away at background. Matthew Henderson was taken into service by Sir Hugh Dalrymple at the age of 14 and have taken a great liking to him. He spent two years in Scotland with the family and then followed the family to their posting in London where he was raised to the position of footman. From the Newgate Calendar, 1746, Matthew Henderson. This offender was born at North Berwick in Scotland, where he was educated in the liberal manner customary in that country. Sir Hugh Dalrymple, being a member of the British Parliament, took Henderson into his service when 14 years of age and brought him to London. Before he was 19 years old, he married one of his master's maids, but Sir Hugh, who had a great regard for him, did not dismiss him, though he was greatly chagrined at these circumstances. He had lived with his master for five years, about three years in Scotland and two years in London, and declared no servants could be better used than he was, and that he never had the least dislike to the deceased, for that she was a lady of great humanity and greatly respected by all her servants, and his masters and most worthy gentlemen. The Incident The crime seems to have been started by a literal misstep. Matthew trod on the toe of Mrs. Dalrymple. Whether this was by cheeky design or by accident, and it's never clarified. From the Newgate Calendar, 1746, Matthew Henderson. Some few days before the commission of the murder, Sir Hugh, having occasion to go out of town for a month, summoned Henderson to assist in dressing him, and, while he was thus employed, Sir Hugh's lady going into the room, the servant casually trod on her toe. She said not a word on the occasion, but looked at him with a degree of rage that made him extremely uneasy. 
When Sir Hugh had taken his leave, she demanded of Henderson why he had trod on her toe, in answer to which he made many apologies and ascribed the circumstance to mere accident. But she gave him a blow on the ear and declared that she would dismiss him from her service. Henderson said it would be unnecessary to turn him away, for he would go without compulsion. But, reflecting that her passion would soon subside, he continued in his place and was used with as much kindness as if the accident had not taken place. Offended by the insult that had been offered him, Henderson began to consider how he should be revenged, and at length came to the fatal resolution of murdering his mistress. The Crime The description of the crime comes from Henderson's own confession, whilst at Newgate Prison. From the Newgate Calendar, 1746. One night, Mary Platt, the maidservant, told him she would go and see her husband, and he said she might do as she pleased. She went and took the key to let herself in again. He shut the door after her and went and cleaned up some plate in the kitchen. From thence he went up into the back parlour where he used to lie and let down his bed in order to go to sleep. He pulled off his shoes and tied up his hair with his garter, and at that moment the thought came into his head to kill his lady. He went downstairs into the kitchen, took a small iron cleaver, and went up to the first landing place on the stairs, and after tarrying a minute or two came down, shocked at the crime he was about to perpetrate. He went up again as far as the first window, and the watchman was saying, Past twelve o'clock. After the watchman had passed the door, he entered the room a second time and went to the bedside and drew the curtains and found she was fast asleep. He went twice from the bed to the door in great perplexity of mind, the deceased being still asleep. He continued in great agonies but soon felt where she lay and made twelve or fourteen motions with the cleaver before he struck. He repeated his blows, and in struggling she fell out of bed next to the window, and then he thought it was time to put her out of her misery, and he struck her with all his might as she lay on the floor. He then went into his bedchamber again and sat down on his bed for about ten minutes, when it came into his head to rob the house. He again went into the deceased's bedchamber and took her pockets as they were hanging on the chair and took a gold watch and two diamond rings out of the drawers with several other things. Suspicion almost immediately points to Henderson, who sticks by his story of innocence. He half-heartedly attempts to implicate others, but these attempts are proven to be groundless. Henderson is brought before a tribunal as they investigate the murder. From the Derby Mercury, the 28th of March, 1746. Tuesday, Matthew Henderson, being brought before Sir Thomas de Vale, was, after eight hours of examination, committed to the gatehouse for further examination for a most bloody murder committed upon the body of Mrs. Dalrymple, the wife of Captain Dalrymple, of Colonel Douglas's regiment, late on Monday night last. At her house in Wigmore Street, Cavendish Square, she received upwards of a hundred wounds. Four other persons are impeached by the above-said Henderson, who, although brought up in the family from five years of age, is the very person that cut her throat. The house was robbed of a very considerable value in jewels, money, and other things. But the circumstances of this barbarous scene are so intricate that it is impossible yet to give the public a full account of it. Several of the ladies' goods were found upon the said Henderson. As the investigations continue, and the people he had attempted to put blame on 
are all to be found innocent. Henderson cracks. From the Iris Birmingham Gazette, 31st of March, 1746. On Thursday, Robert Wright, Esquire, finished his inquiry on the lady of Captain Dalrymple. The servant maid, one Mary Platt, gave a very circumstantial evidence so as to clear herself of the least imputation in being concerned in the murder. Matthew Henderson, the footboy, at first said nothing material, but the coroner, ordering an iron cleaver to be laid before him on the table, which cleaver was found in the bog house outhouse, he instantly turned about, wept bitterly, and declared he knew it very well, for it was with that he had murdered his mistress when she was asleep. He said he gave her several blows with it before that she awakened, and the words she then used were, Oh, Lord, what is that? But he pursued his blows, and, in struggling, the lady tumbled out of bed, where he also repeated his blows. Mrs. Dalrymple had six prodigious wounds upon her head, one of her eyes, cut out, both her cheek bones cut through, and in two places of the head cut into the brain. He acknowledged no person was concerned with him in the act, and the other persons he had sworn against were innocent, which the other accused people sufficiently proved. The other wounds the lady had upon her body were, as near as could be computed, about forty. The jury were composed of the principal inhabitants of the three adjoining parishes, and a great number of nobility and gentry were to hear the melancholy inquiry. With his confession and the stolen goods found on him, Henderson is found guilty, although he appears very contrite and regretful of his actions. It makes no difference. Henderson is sentenced to death and to the ultimate punishment, gibbeting. From the Stamford Mercury, the 1st of May, 1746. Yesterday morning, Matthew Henderson, footman to the Honourable Captain William Dalrymple, was carried in a cart from Newgate and executed at the end of New Bond Street for the murder of his lady went to the place of execution in a white waistcoat, drawers and stockings. Two clergymen, one of the Church of England and the other of the Church of Scotland, prayed with him in the cart for a considerable time. He went out of the cart, up a ladder, and trembled very much. It seemed under the most terrible agonies and behaved very penitent. His body was carried from the gallows and hung in irons, on a common about five miles from London, on the Edgware Road. Case 2 From 1742 London we jump to 1885 Blenheim Palace. The spectacular Blenheim Palace was built in 1704 and was gifted to the first Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill, by Queen Anne. Blenheim Palace was the birthplace of Sir Winston Churchill, and continues to be lived in by the 12th Duke of Marlborough and his family. Background. William Beckley, a 60-year-old man working as a blacksmith and general repairman at Blenheim Park, lived with his daughter at Watergate Cottage. He often came into contact for work with George Boddington, who was around the same age as William. Their antagonism towards each other was well known on the estate. On the 12th of August, 1885, Boddington called on another estate worker and remarkably said, I believe old Beckley lies dead up the road here under a tree. The two men approached the tree. Beckley had been bludgeoned. He was indeed dead. Police arrived and began their investigation. Their primary suspect was George Boddington, the man who had discovered the body. Boddington, who was around the same age as the now deceased Beckley, 
had had a long history of conflict with Beckley over many years. This long-standing battle between the two seems to have come to a head recently surrounding a missing tar brush. As each accuses the other, Boddington tarred Beckley's shirt. This incident resulted in a warning to Boddington by the estate manager threatening Boddington with permanent dismissal. It doesn't take long for the police to place Boddington as their prime suspect. He is arrested and is taken on remand in Oxford jail as police collect evidence and build a case. From the Morning Post, the 15th of August, 1885, the inquest on the body of William Beckley, blacksmith aged 64 years, whose body was found in Blenheim Park, Woodstock, with marks as if he had been killed by a spade, was opened yesterday and adjourned. At the commencement of the proceedings, the coroner asked if anyone had, had been apprehended, and Police Inspector Oakley replied that George Boddington, an ex-keeper, was in custody, charged on suspicion. Sarah Ann Beckley identified the body as that of her father and said that the prisoner and her father had been working together, tiring some railings, and had frequently quarrelled. A gamekeeper named Shield stated that he passed the prisoner and Beckley at two o'clock. They both appeared all right, but shortly after two o'clock, Boddington went to the lodge and said he had found Beckley dead. A spade and an iron rail with which it is supposed the fatal injuries were inflicted were produced in court. Considerable excitement prevails in the neighbourhood and the Woodstock County Magistrates have arranged a special sitting for the purpose of hearing the evidence against Boddington, who is stated to have admitted to the police that he had during the morning had a difference with Beckley. The national papers all scream the Blenheim Park murder, with an explanation that the location is the home of the Duke of Marlborough. Efforts are made to resolve the case as quickly as possible to help reduce the embarrassment and scandal to the family. Boddington is given clergy support within the prison with much pressure to confess and cleanse his soul. Boddington does confess. He outlines in detail the crime he committed and how it took place. From the Leeds Mercury, the 20th of August, 1885, the Blenheim Park murder. The magisterial examination into circumstances connected with the murder on the 12th of William Beckley, aged 64, formerly blacksmith and gamekeeper, but latterly keeper of the Water Meadow Lodge, Blenheim Park, began yesterday in the Town Hall, Woodstock. A labourer named George Boddington, who had been arrested the day after the murder on suspicion, was brought from Oxford Prison in the morning by Deputy Chief Constable Berensby and was charged with the capital offence. Mr Higgs, solicitor of Woodstock, appeared for the prisoner. The witnesses who were examined at the inquest were first called and deposed to the frequent quarrels between the deceased and the prisoner over their work, particularly during the last three months while they had been engaged upon the same job. There had also been unpleasantness on account of the more than ordinary attention shown by the prisoner toward the daughter of the deceased. On the day in question, the men were at work gas-tiring a fence in the park, and some words ensued between them as to some water being in the tar which the prisoner had just fetched from the gatehouse. During the morning, the two men were observed a keeper named Shields at their work, but nothing unusual appears to have been noticed until Boddington made his appearance at Springlock Lodge and stated that he had found Beckley under a tree and believed he was dead. 
The body was removed home in a cart, and on the following morning an examination was made of it by Dr McClure of Woodstock, who found a wound about five inches in length extending from the right eye to the pole of the left jaw, completely fracturing the bones of the nose and laying bare the cheekbone, and another wound being behind the right ear, where the skull was deeply and extensively fractured. The prisoner was apprehended on the following morning when he denied all knowledge of the crime, but he was remanded by the Honourable M. Ponsonby to Oxford Prison. It was first surmised that a partly worn spade found near the body was the instrument by which the injury had been inflicted, but after being in prison until Monday, the prisoner gave certain information which led to a further search in the neighbourhood where the body was found, with the result that a formidable and hefty grubbing axe was found by Police Sergeant Hawkin, and also an indentation of the tree under which the body was discovered, corresponding with the blade of the axe. The Reverend F. J. Chavez, rector of St. Peter Le Bailey in Oxford, who is doing temporary duty as chaplain of the prison, was called and stated that the prisoner of his own free will made a statement to him after he was cautioned on Monday. The prisoner's solicitor objected to the statement being read, but it was understood to be to the effect that the deceased greatly annoyed the prisoner by calling him a scamp and other name. This so exasperated him that he struck him with an axe with which he was splitting wood. The deceased rolled over and seemed very much injured, and the prisoner then struck him again and went home to dinner. On his return he found the deceased was dead. He then gave information at Springlock Lodge. The prisoner's shirt upon which appears some stains and the axe had been submitted to the public analyst for examination, which it has not yet concluded, and the case was adjourned for a week for its completion. Boddington's trial took place in October 1885. Although Boddington had already confessed to Berkeley's murder, he pleaded not guilty. Boddington's defence struggled to recover from the confession. There is a history of mental instability within the family and in Boddington's life itself. This becomes the defence to try to help Boddington avoid a sentence of death. Boddington had, in his younger years, been thrown out of the London police force for drunkenness. In Oxford, his new residence, he had been committed to Littlemore Asylum, suffering delusions, memory loss and exhibiting bouts of violent behaviour. Boddington's mother had also spent time in Littlemore Asylum. Boddington's daughter also testified, confirming her father's erratic behaviour. It took the jury 30 minutes to find Boddington guilty. From the Manchester Courier, the 31st of October, 1885. Murder of a gamekeeper, sentence of death. Oxford Assizes on Tuesday, George Boddington, under gamekeeper in the employ of the Duke of Marlborough, was charged with the willful murder of William Beckley in Blenheim Park. During his imprisonment, the accused confessed to having struck the deceased several terrible blows. The defence was that he was not responsible for his actions and it was proven that his mother was a lunatic and that he himself, some years ago, was for nearly 12 months an inmate of an asylum. The jury returned a verdict of guilty with a recommendation to mercy on account of his age and his former infirmities sentence of death was passed. The jury's recommendation for mercy is heard and results in a commutation to prison. Boddington's death sentence is replaced 
with a custodial sentence. Boddington died in prison two years later. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, Murder Among the Moneyed. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.